I'm not troubled in my heart about your self-esteem. I'm not troubled in my heart about whether or not you feel good about yourself, whether or not life is turning out like you want it to turn out, or whether or not your checkbook is balanced. There's only one thing that gave me a sleepless night. There's only one thing that troubled me all throughout the morning, and that is this. Within a hundred years, a great majority of people in this building will possibly be in hell. And many who even profess Jesus Christ as Lord will spend an eternity in hell. So many people are deceived and so many youth are deceived and so many adults are deceived into believing that because they prayed a prayer one time in their life, they're going to heaven. And then when they look around at others who profess to know Christ and see those people also just as worldly as the world, and they compare themselves by themselves, nothing troubles their heart. They think, well, I'm the same as most in my youth group. I watch things I shouldn't watch on television and laugh about the very things that God hates. I wear clothing that is sensual. I talk like the world. I walk like the world. I love the music of the world. I love so much that's in the world. But bless God, I am a Christian. Why am I a Christian? Because there was a time in my life when I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I want you to know that the greatest heresy in the American Evangelical and Protestant Church is that if you pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, He will definitely come in. You will not find that in any place in Scripture. You will not find that anywhere in Baptist history until about 50 years ago. What you need to know is that salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And faith alone in Jesus Christ is preceded and followed by repentance. A turning away from sin, a hatred for the things that God hates and a love for the things that God loves. A growing in holiness and a desire not to be like Britney Spears, not to be like the world, and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. If you go back to your hometown and knock on every door, because I went back to my hometown after I got saved and knocked on every door, and you know what I found out? Everyone in my town is a Christian. 85% of them do not go to church, and those who do go to church are not concerned about holiness, they're not concerned about serving, they're not concerned about being separate from the world, they're not concerned about the gospel being preached among the nations. But bless God, they're saved. Why are they saved? Because some evangelist who should have spent less time preaching and more time studying his Bible told them they were saved. And he did it so that he could brag about how many people came forward in his next revival. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. There is a narrow gate. The only way any human being on this earth will ever be saved is through Jesus Christ. And that is all. Because you need to realize the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and you have no idea what that means. That we were born radically depraved and God hating. That we would have never sought God, never come to God. We have rebelled against God, broken every law. It's not just an issue that you have sinned. The issue is you've never done anything but sin. The Bible says in the prophets that even our greatest works are like filthy rags before God. And because of that, you know what we deserve? The wrath of God. God is a holy God. That's something that the Americans have forgotten. Many of the things that you love to do, God hates. Did you know that? Pray for revival. You're going to have a youth meeting. You want God to move. But before you go there, you watch programs on television that God absolutely despises. And then you wonder why the Holy Spirit hasn't fallen on a place and why you have to create false fire and false excitement. Because God's not in it. Most of our Christianity is based on cliches that we read on the back of Christian t-shirts. Most of our Christianity comes from songwriters and not the Bible. 
Most of what we believe to be true is dictated to us by our culture and not by the Bible. The Bible never teaches that a person can be a genuine Christian and live in continuous carnality and wickedness and sin all the days of their life. But the Bible teaches that the genuine Christian has been given a new nature. If you are genuinely a born-again Christian, a child of God, you will walk in the way of righteousness as a style of life. And if you step off that path of righteousness, the Father will come for you. He will discipline you. He will put you back on that path. But if you profess to have gone through the narrow gate and yet you live in the broad way, just like all the other people in your high school, just like all the other people who are carnal and wicked, the Bible wants you to know that you should be terribly, terribly afraid. But you know not God. You will know them by their fruit. How will you know a false prophet in the wider application here in all of Scripture? How will you know if someone is a genuine Christian? By their fruit. By their fruit, my dear friend. Look at your life. Look at the way you walk. Look at the way you talk. Look at the passions of your heart. Is Jesus in there somewhere? Or is he just some accessory that you add on to your life? Is he just something you do on Wednesday or Sunday? Is he something that you give a mental assent to? Is he an accessory or is he the very center of your life? How is it that so many people today profess to have had an encounter with Jesus Christ and yet they are not permanently changed? Is God working in your life? You will know them by their fruit. And he says, anyone who does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What is he talking about? My dear friend, he is talking about the judgment of Almighty God that will one day fall upon the world. That will one day fall possibly upon you. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Do you know what your profession of faith in Jesus Christ is worth? Absolutely nothing. This fellow who is making this profession, he is not someone who just all of a sudden decided it's judgment and I better profess him to be Lord. This is a person who emphatically declares to other people that Jesus Christ is Lord. He walks around saying Lord. He dances up in front while the musicians are playing saying Lord. He sings the songs Lord. But Jesus said to him, depart from me, I never knew you. The evidence, the way that you can have assurance that you are genuinely a born again Christian is that you do as a style of life the will of the Father. You say, oh, you're talking about works. No, I'm not. I'm talking about evidence of faith. And look how he describes the lost man here. He says, depart from me, those of you who claim to be my disciples, who confessed me as Lord, and yet you live as though I never gave you a law to obey. I just described a great majority of North American Christianity. If anyone starts talking about law, if anyone starts talking about biblical principles on what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do, how we're to live and not supposed to live, everyone starts screaming legalists. In American Christianity today, pass through the gate, praise God, live like the rest of the world and it's okay, you're just carnal, maybe one day you'll come back. Do you know what happens because of our bad evangelism? We have gazillions of children saved in vacation Bible school. When they hit 15 years old, they enter into the world and live like demons, a great majority of them. And then when they're around 30, they come back and rededicate their life. Maybe they just got saved. Because folks, it's more than just telling someone you're saved because you acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Satan acknowledges that Jesus is Lord. I'm talking about Christianity. I have spent my life in jungles. I have spent my life freezing in the Andes Mountains. I have seen people die. A little boy, Andrew Maimon, the Muslim shot him five times through the stomach and left him on a sidewalk simply because he cried out, I am so afraid, but I can not 
deny Jesus Christ. Please don't kill me, but I will not deny him. And he died in a pool of blood. And you talk about being a radical Christian because you wear a t-shirt. I don't wish the same things your parents want for you. They want for you security and insurance and nice homes. They want for you cars and respect. I want for you the same thing I want for my son. That one day he takes a banner and the banner of Jesus Christ and he places it on a hill where no one has ever placed the banner before. And he cries out, Jesus Christ is Lord, even if it costs my son his life. Oh, when he's 18 years old, if he says to me the same thing I said when I was a young man, I'm going into the mountains, I'm going into the jungle, and they say, you can't go there, you're insane, it's a war, you're going to die, I'm going. When that little boy puts on that backpack, I'm going to pray over him and say, go, go. On that final day, beloved, precious little girl, beloved, precious young man, on that final day, will your confession hold true? Are you saved? There are two ways. There's a narrow way and a broad way. Which one are you on?